In the lecture on Leviticus and the tabernacle, I briefly mention the sacrificial system. But here I want to go into a little bit more detail because I think many of the sacrifices are, are kind of unknown uh, to most Christians, especially most Protestant Christians. Since Leviticus, if we are reading through the Bible, tends to be the one we usually pay the least attention to. So I want to outline what some of the sacrifices are because not all of them have to do with sin. The first one that is mentioned in the book of Leviticus is the burnt offering, the Olah. The Olah is a gift to God. It is said to have a soothing odor and it is an offering that is not consumed by humans. It is only for God and so it is, it is usually fully burned up on an altar. It took place in the morning and the evening together with a cereal and drink offering. A lamb was to be, t to be the daily offering, but in other contexts one could offer an ola and domesticated animals were offered, usually male, always unblemished. Wild animals were not, even clean wild animals were not to be offered. The Ola, besides part of the daily ritual of the tabernacle, could also be given in thanksgiving, sometimes in expiation for guilt, sometimes to fill a, a vow, sometimes to seek the Lord's favor. Part of the ceremony was the ritual of laying one's hand on the head of the animal. In a sense, one could think of this as when one lays one's hand on the animal, one is sort of offering the animal as a substitute for oneself and in a sense, in being burned up, the animal is going up into God's presence, and so the worshiper is going up into God's presence. Some people will offer, sep uh, will uh, note separately the grain offering, the korban, in Leviticus 2. This also is a gift to God. And it can be seen to go with the burnt offering and other offerings. But here only part of it is burned and the rest is consumed by the priests. This represents the giving of the fruit of human labor and it always accompanies other sacrifices. If you remember Jesus is saying in the Gospels when he chides the um, the uh, Pharisees for setting things aside as korban, as gifts to be offered to God, but thereby refusing to take care of their parents. There is also what is translated as the peace offering here in Leviticus 3, shulamim, it is related to the word shalom, meaning peace, um, well-being. There are three subtypes. One is to offer it as thanksgiving, as payment of a vow, and just as a free will offering for no reason except because one wants to. This is primarily a sacrifice intended for human festivity and consumption. It is a covenant meal which affirmed the relationship between the worshiper God and the community. So basically it's to throw a party. At this point in Israel's history, the, the killing of an animal for a meal for meat is basically done in the context of the tabernacle. It is not a daily occurrence. 
The burnt offering and the peace offering were often done together. The burnt offering was for God, the peace offering for the humans. The animal could be either male or female, must be unblemished. And again, it would be a domesticated animal. However, the blood and the fat were reserved for God. Another kind of sacrifice is a purification offering, or sometimes it is translated a sin offering. But generally, it does not always have to do with intentional sin. Um, you might call these lesser sins, or unintentional sins, or um, violating some aspect of purity. These are performed during the process of purification. And that purification is after an unintentional sin or ritual uncleanness. The ritual involves pouring the blood on the altar sides, burning the animal's fat, and there is a special disposal of the remains. Related to this, in Leviticus 5 6, uh, through 6, 7, is what is called the asham, or restitution offering. It is a kind of purification or sin offering that also carries a penalty in addition to the sacrifice. And here it's a kind of expiation for certain infractions. So for example, if there is a general call to testify in a particular situation and one refuses to testify, one then realizing one's sin goes through this purification offering and one also offers a penalty. It can be after touching an unclean thing or human uncleanness. It can be after making a rash oath or involve fraud or deceit if one realizes that, uh, that one has sinned in misrepresenting something or deceiving somebody, one brings a sacrifice and also swearing falsely. These involve compensating the person you have wronged and bringing a ram or its equivalent to the priest to make atonement. So there's compensation and atonement at the same time. The Day of Atonement is a special kind of day. It's not something that is done on a daily basis, nor in particular situations, but it is a yearly occurrence. In Jewish circles today, it is called Yom Kippur. Um, we find references in early Hebrew texts calling it the Yom HaKippurim. And we can think of it as a kind of a reset button performed yearly to restore unity between God and his people. Hence the word coined in the Middle Ages by William Tyndale, at one mint. So our word for atonement comes from this at one mint, a desire to restore unity with, between God and his people. Here, two goats are chosen. One is killed as a sin offering while the second, over whom the priest confesses Israel's sins, is sent into the wilderness, thus ending the threat of punishment. The blood of the goat that is killed is sprinkled in front of the mercy seat within the Holy of Holies, or holiest place. The blood is considered to be purifying, and thus the Holy of Holies itself is purified, this Day of Atonement can be a response to intentional sin.